do our very dead level best to be in and out of here on time and on schedule. But if you've got friends or you want to come back and to reference it, uh, we'll be all set. So we're going to go ahead and we're recording the session now. And uh, again, my name is Rick Lippert. I'm with Easy Photo Scan, and we're excited about having you here. You deal with photo scanning. If you deal with this, you've probably been dealing with photo scanning. You probably know that business some at some degree of expertise. But what about all that other media and that analog format, and how do you get those into digital masters? Well, that's what we're going to be talking about today, and you are going to be just so excited about our presentation. But before we do that, I would like to have us take in the head to July 12th, second Tuesday of the month at 2 o'clock. And at that time, we're going to have a guest with us who's extremely special to talk about unlocking the power of photos, uh, pictures with photo scanning both yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Bruce Holroyd from Kodak Colaris is joining us. He has been the worldwide product manager for the Kodak Picture Saver Scanners, and he's going to bring to light kind of how to see businesses evolving and looking ahead a little bit. So everybody is going to be excited about that. But now I'm going to ask James um, just to go over real quick about the notes and the questions. James, can you go ahead and do that for me? Yeah, thanks, Rick. Just a few more housekeeping notes. All of the attendees, you guys are muted and on listen-only mode. So if you do have a question throughout the webinar, go ahead and send that via chat. And we will have a Q&A at the end so we can get through everyone's questions, and we will stay on as long as we need to make sure every question gets answered and uh, everyone's issues are addressed. So go ahead, Rick. Our speaker today is Jim Appleton. He is a preservation evangelist. This guy is fantastic. You're going to be um, just begging for more when he does stop. He's got a fantastic presentation put together. He's the founder and owner of Meet preservation out of Dallas, Texas, and he has got some insight into preserving analog media beyond just photographs. They do that as well there, but beyond just photographs, and he's got some fantastic things for you to think about as you, as you encounter that. He works with businesses to help them as well, so you may want to make sure at the end to get Jim's number and touch base with him afterwards. There may be some synergy there for you in what you do as well. Jim works with businesses, um, some of the nation's largest businesses. I don't know if you've heard of places like 7-Eleven, Southwest Airlines, Boy Scouts. He's got a whole bunch of experience in preserving not only just people's memories, but whole communities and whole businesses' uh, memories. And so without any further ado, Jim, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, thank you very much, Rick. It was a very nice introduction. Uh, guys, uh, like, like you said, I am Jim Appleton. I'm the owner of Showcase Productions, a video production company and media asset preservation. We've had a 25,000 square foot video production company facility for the last 30 years. Uh, six years ago, we started media asset preservation to really focus on preserving visual and audio media history and place them into a searchable database accessible from any place on the internet. We have transferred the assets to 7-Eleven, Southwest Airlines, the Boy Scouts, the Dallas Holocaust Museum, the Kennedy Sixth Floor Museum, churches, individuals, and more. And quite frankly, 7-Eleven was my first client, so the phrase, oh, thank heaven for 7-Eleven has completely new meaning for me. Uh, we're here today to discuss preserving your visual and audio media history, family film, videotape, and audio tape. You are already covered with the protection from your photo history if you've worked with Rick's company, EasyScan. I thought I would start with a 90-second kind of video that gives you a quick overview of, you know, the whole process. Time is your media's worst enemy. All analog media degrades over time. Film, videotape, even DVDs. There's no way to stop it. The company designed to bring all of your media assets into the digital world is Media Asset Preservation. MAP has the capability to transfer virtually any type of media into high quality digital master files that will never degrade over time. As part of this service, MAP also provides you with a free, 
easy to use, secure database that allows members of your team to search, identify, and distribute all assets from any computer connected to the Internet. Each day that passes, media elements stored in boxes, on shelves, or even in vaults are at high risk. Fire or water damage, even obsolete playback systems, may result in losing your media assets forever. Media Asset Preservation is a trusted source for an impressive list of companies and nonprofit organizations. We encourage you to preserve your history. Allow your legacy to live on for generations to come. The clock is ticking. You need to be proactive about preserving your history. It's not important whether we digitize your media assets, whether we teach you how to do it on your own, or whether you hire another company. What is important is that it get done before it's too late. Please visit our website, mediaassetpreservation.com, or better still, call me. I'd be happy to answer any of your questions and give you more detailed information about our services. If you value and really truly value your family, church, or corporate history, the decision cannot be postponed. Your media will continue to deteriorate, some at faster rates than others. Your film is at the most risk, and film in metal cans and containers will deteriorate faster than in a cardboard box. That's why archive film reels are now vented. It allows the gas that degrades the film to escape. Three-quarter inch umatic tape is also highly at risk. This professional tape format generally needs to be baked in a laboratory oven for six to eight hours before it can even be digitized. Super 8 millimeter videotape is also at high risk. As a side note, you should never play your videotape until you have thoroughly inspected it. Any old tape player, even if the one that you might have, should be inspected or you risk damaging your videotape. Some videotape may only have one to three plays before they self-destruct. If you have a tape that's stuck together, playing it will rip it apart. Your tape's oxide will flake off if you fast forward or fast reverse, lowering the quality of any future transfer. Your most important decision is to find and pick a professional, not a consumer company, to digitize and protect your history. It does not make it, it does make a difference in the quality of your archival videos. You have probably received ads like the one I just put up on the screen. They encourage you to protect your VHS by converting it to a DVD. First and foremost, this is really a bad suggestion and idea. DVDs are not good media for storage. They're easily scratched. They can de delaminate. There's one that's delaminated right now, and that, that happened about uh, five days after that DVD was received by us. Uh, the DVD can fade over time, and with that, the files will fade with it permanently, and everything will be lost. If it is a true DVD, then the media is also compressed, and it's not the quality of uncompressed files. The history that you have on a DVD will disappear forever over time. These companies don't care about preserving your history. They only want the revenue for selling you software and or hardware that can give you a substantial, you know, a, basically a substandard video. A professional company will give you an archive quality digital file such as an uncompressed or motion JPEG AVI or an MOV file, plus they should also give you a compressed MPEG-4 video file that plays nicely on any computer. I suggest you download the free VLC Media Player software. It will play all digital files as well as act like a DVD player. If you want a DVD to view your video, that's fine. But without an archived digital file, you will lose your history. But with an archive file, you can always make another DVD. When it gets scratched or damaged, you go back to your digital file, and you can make another one without losing your historical media. It is also important to pick the right company to transfer your media, especially your 8mm or 16mm film. Depending on how your film is stored, and its age, the right equipment can make a big difference in the quality of your transfer. Your film may be warped or may contain mold. Here's examples of mold that was contained. Uh, this happened to be the Boy Scout footage. As you can see, it can be clean if you can get to it soon enough. Let me 
Uh, but if you don't, that film will be lost forever. Now, something very important. Some of your older 16 millimeter film may in fact be flammable. Here's an example of what can happen if you have some of this earlier film before the safety film was invented. Uh, all it takes is ignition source and your house can go up in smoke. It is extremely dangerous. Uh, this would be some of your older film and you won't know basically you know, if you have it or not. Uh, again, it's important to pick a professional company. Uh, there are a lot of consumer companies out there. They claim to be able to take care of your needs, uh, but they don't realize that the consumer systems will give you different levels of detail. Here's an example that shows the difference between a direct transfer system that is consumer related, and that's what we basically started with a number of years ago, as well as now a new high def film scanner. Take a, take a notice of the trees on the right hand side. You can see the detail come out in the HD scanner. Also the details in the uh, young lady's hair. That happens to be filmed from 1950s. That actually is my mother. Uh, but you can see more detail in the trees, uh, more detail in the hair. The little girl's hair in particular, I'll just pause it here. You can see the tremendous detail uh, in the right hand side of the film scanner, etc. It is also important to realize that as the film ages, it does lose its original color. The green and blue component of an RGB signal will disappear, leaving the film as mostly red. Here's what can be done with the color correction. Teenage scouts and explorers from all over the USA come to match with... Now you can see the original film was to, on the left. Uh, the film on the right has been color corrected. Our new HD scanner color corrects it automatically. These are commercials from Dr. Pepper. Uh, again, the raw film transfer is your level on your left. And you can several levels of color correction. So uh, let me go ahead and just pause this. Ba basically what happens with, with the film, as it ages, it uh, loses its color. It can become totally red. If you can get to it soon enough, you have the ability to color correct it. If you don't, uh, you're basically going to be left with something that's all red, and at that point, you would then convert it to a black and white film to save it. Uh, if it continues to deteriorate, you basically end up with nothing, and you throw the film away. The film scanners, especially the ones that we use, can handle film that's slightly warped or has sprocket damage. Uh, a lot of instances of, of sprocket damage can, can come back to haunt you. We had a case where um, we did about 90 film transfers for a high school football. And they were going to put together a, a video tribute for their you know, convention. And we transferred 90 reels of the basically 100. We couldn't transfer 10. And we were using an old Telesini system, which was a professional uh, film transfer system. And 10 reels had sprocket damage. We could not transfer them. When the new scanner came in, we were able to transfer the 10 reels that we couldn't transfer with sprocket damage on the telecine system, but it created a serious problem for us. We had to talk to the client and let them know that the 10 reels that we now have successfully transferred were so substantially better in quality that they're going to stick out like a sore thumb. So we basically gave the client an option. I will transfer all of your 90 reels on the new HD scanner a third the cost, uh, or I gave them another option that basically said, okay, I will at no cost to you bring those 10 reels that are super quality into my Avid editing system and make them look worse. Uh, basically make them match so when they edit the, together the program, you're not going to see a difference in quality of clarity, color, uh, and the whole thing. So the film scanner does a substantially better job with anything that has you know, film sprocket damage. Uh, the, and again, one of the things that's important, make sure you ask whatever company you choose what brand of scanner the company will be using to transfer their film or your film. 
Ours, for example, is the same scanner used by the Library of Congress and Warner Brothers Pictures. This happens to be an image of my, my son. Uh, because my son was an Eagle Scout, and the fact that I have been actually doing video production and duplication for the Boy Scouts for the last 25 years, I agreed uh, to color correct their 1,600 reels of film for free as part of my transfer. Okay, uh, Their film dates back to the early 1920s. That is the Boy Scout film footage that's up there right now. Uh, after we got the contract, I realized that I had committed to over 6,000 hours of color correction. Uh, I would never see my wife again. That's the reason that we searched the country and found a film scanner that would automatically color correct and save my marriage and improve the clarity and detail of the film. You might basically, you might have treasures. You never know what's sitting in your closet. You never know what's, what's sitting in your, unfortunately, a lot of people store things in their garages. Uh, but here, here's an example of something that my cousin shot in 1969. Albert was a budding young videographer and brought along his camera. In fact, on the last morning, Jimi Hendrix and his band took the stage for a two-hour show. Alongside, without asking anyone, Albert set up his half-inch tape recorder and black-and-white camera. Albert recorded the entire two-hour performance. Everybody just gave me the look like, well, I guess he's supposed to be here. And then uh, realizing that uh, the last act, Jimi Hendrix, was going to be uh, uh, mine to be able to record, uh, I was very thrilling. Albert met Hendricks later and showed the rock star the videotape of his performance. Hendricks died tragically only a year after Woodstock. Albert kept the tape of the Hendricks show for years locked up in his closet. Now, the Jimi Hendrix Experience Museum in Seattle has purchased the tape for showing in their museum. Basically, I graduated from Dartmouth College in 1970. Woodstock took place in 1969. I didn't go because I was a football player and I could have cared less. But my cousin was a hippie. He picked up Jimi Hendrix drummer hitchhiking on the road and was invited to film Mr. Hendrix. And the world didn't know until I transferred this footage that was called CVC format videotape. It looked like half an inch, half inch audio tape, but in fact was video. That uh, my cousin had gotten on stage and filmed that entire two-hour performance of Jimi Hendrix at Woodstock. And again, here's an example in the next video. You never know what also you might have in your closet. Uh, in this particular case, our Cocker Spaniel could climb pecan trees. As a little puppy, my wife got very angry when she saw the, the dog in the tree and claimed that I'd put her up there, and of course I had not. So we actually uh, filmed her, and World's Funniest Animal, or World's Funniest Videos uh, showed it. She scared the squirrels. Uh, squirrels were taunting her, and then we saw her do this. And I'm very eccentric. And this next scene you're going to see, and I think this is what got the attention of World's Finest Animal, I put a Superman cape on her. Uh, I also slow motioned it down so it actually looked like she was flying when she got up the screen. Again. Boy Scouts and the 1,600 reels of film that we have for the Boy Scouts, they have some very valuable footage. And again, you never know what you have or corporations you may be involved with might have uh, that some of this is saleable. Uh, I am trying to, which is crazy, but I'm trying to help save high school and college game films. Uh, they don't have budgets. I'm trying to work that out for them because I don't want to see that disappear. There is, for example, a high school in Los Angeles that has spawned more NFL athletes than any high school in the country. It's called Dorsey High School. But sadly, most of the game films are sitting in the next coach's garage. So again, here's some footage from the Boy Scouts. Boy Scouts of America on this anniversary, and also to uh, congratulate the Fair family who have been chosen.
Scouting Family of the Year, Mr. Fair, who has devoted a good deal of his life to giving leadership. When you help start a scout troop, there's no guarantee that one of the scouts will grow up and be in the movies. But you never know. When you help start a scout troop, there's no guarantee one of the boys will grow up to hit 755 home runs. But you never know. Call Boy Scouts of America. And again, uh, your family history. It's important to protect it now. You don't want to postpone it. You don't want to sit it on the back burner because it's going to continue to deteriorate the longer you keep it, especially if you keep it in your garage or the attic. Uh, you've got some real problems. Uh, this next video is very important because we recently transferred some 16 millimeter film of a gentleman by the name of Clint Frank's son. I'll just go ahead and play it. Okay, Clint Frank was the number three winner of the Heisman Trophy. Uh, he played at Yale, but sadly, all of his film uh, was given to Yale on his death. I got it over here, transferred it for Yale, and here this footage of his son, obviously he never saw. So that's another reason why you need to go ahead and transfer your stuff as soon as possible. Uh, and ba basically, protect it, share it. Let your kids see it. Fires, floods, tornadoes, they can destroy your media in a flash. Uh, we've had a lot of tornadoes here in Dallas. Uh, they tear apart towns. And sadly in the news, what you see most is the people going in the rubble and not looking for a microwave or they're not looking for their furniture. They're looking for family photographs. They're looking for family video. They're looking for the treasures that represent their history. That's why it is very, very important to get this stuff transferred and protected. Here's an example. And again, my mom was an actor. If, if you all have ever seen the movie The Notebook, then you've seen my mother. Uh, the young man took his girl to the movies to see a movie filmed in the 1930s. It was called Little Abner, starring Buster Keaton and Martha Driscoll. Martha Driscoll was my mom, and she played Daisy May in that particular film. But sadly, most of my mom's movie pictures were held by my sister. My sister was more or less the archivist of our family. And several years ago, one million gallons of mud entered my sister's house and destroyed half of her family history and half of my mom's movie pictures. And basically, while some of these pictures exist, uh, there she is with Cecil B. DeMille on the left. Uh, the one on the right, she was actually in the movie Gone with the Wind, and Clark Gable did ask mom to marry him. And luckily, he said, or she said, no, or I wouldn't be talking to you right now. Uh, there she is with Mickey Rooney. There she is with Errol Flynn. It's something important to preserve and share. And one thing, just as a side note, if you all have never interviewed, if your parents are still alive, if your grandparents are still alive, do something that I didn't do. I've been in the video production business for 30 years. I never interviewed my mother. That was a mistake. You need to go ahead, and even if it's with a cell phone, interview your parents, your grandparents, because they have a story to tell. That story represents you know, your history, and it's something that you can share. And do that before you lose them. Okay, on my mom's movie career, not too many kids can say that their mother was attacked by Dracula and saved by the Wolfman, but I can. Now, in this film, probably back in the 30s, that bat is probably some guy with a stick, you know, flapping the wings of it. You never know. But that's my mom laying on the bed. Drac is trying to get into her room now. The records that everybody has corporations, churches, individuals. They're treasures. It's important. 
you've got to go ahead and get those transfer. You know, pick a company that you like. Pick a company that that's going to do the job you expect them to do. Uh, make sure that, that the company is going to give you the kind of files that are required. Make sure they educate you how to handle them. People also don't realize that just putting a file on a USB drive, they're not going to be safe. If you don't put that USB drive in occasionally to charge it because it's magnetic, at some point in time, that drive may die. You may not have lost your information, but it's very costly to get it back. Uh, you can put it on the cloud, but you know what is the cloud? It's just somebody else's server. It's nothing fancy. But again, you've got to back it up. Uh, we, on our professional tape for the major corporations, we also back it up to LTO5 and LTO6 tape, and we make sure that they have it in two different locations. So if there was ever a fire in their facility, they haven't, again, lost everything. Don't put off the preservation project. Pick a professional company that can give you the quality you deserve and basically expect. Leave a legacy for future generations. Thank you. Wow, Jim. Um, I, I don't know what to say about the uh, super cocker spaniel dog. That was uh, amazing. And uh, <laughs> the... the uh, the the stories about your mom uh, are are just yeah those are those are very treasured. A couple of quick things. Uh, if you uh, want to ask a question, please go ahead and and start asking them now. I've got a couple of them uh, that have already come in, Jim. So if it's okay, what we're going to do at this point is just go through the questions. Sure. Um, and if you do need to drop off, please understand that at the end we are going to have a. Uh, uh, little poll here, so if you want to go ahead and um, just take a quick what describes your interest today. Are you a professional in organizing, a preservationist, an archivist, a uh, hobby, or, or some other? If you just go ahead and take a, a vote there, and then what we'll do is we'll show those results to you in a few minutes. Uh, so if you'll just take just a moment, and um, then we'll come back and we'll give you another moment or two. Please take the poll. and. One more time here. All right. So James, if you'll go ahead and um, on on this poll, close it here, we'll, so that we can get back to uh, sharing the screen. Perfect. And we'll tabulate those results in just a couple of minutes. Perfect. Um, Jim, you said about uh, the cans on on um, certain kinds of video deteriorated. How would we know the difference between the cans? Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, okay. Any uh, speaking about film, okay. The majority of of 16 millimeter film years ago was put in metal containers. Okay, that being the case, any container that contains film is at risk because what happens? A gas begins to form inside that container, and they call it. You know, it, if it smells like vinegar, if you open up the can and it knocks your socks off, you've got a problem. Okay, when the gas begins in a metal can. It can't escape, so it works on itself, so it deteriorates the film much, much faster. When you open up the can, if the, if the film is hard as a rock, you got a problem. If the film is slightly warped, some of the new film, film scanners will actually be able to transfer it. Uh, but if the film is as hard as a, as a you know, hammer, you pretty much have lost that film. Uh, we just transferred some film recently for a professional athlete, and this was back in the 1940s. And unfortunately, half the film was gone. The film for the Boy Scouts went back to the 1920s. We were actually able to transfer all of their film without any, any problems. So it depends on how it's stored, where it's stored, the conditions it's stored, if it's stored in an attic. But generally, with individuals, they have their film in cardboard boxes. Other than mold growing on a piece of film, on a, on a, on a film reel, they're going to be safer because basically the gas will vent away. That's why they have the archival reels that have vents in them for that specific reason. But it's metal cans that are the most in danger. And when you take that lid off, if you smell something, get it over to somebody like us quickly. OK, thank you for that. And um, Bud, yes, the answer to your question is we will be uh, recording this and making it available to all the attendees. When you logged in, you gave us your email account, and we will have that available. Plus, then we'll put it up on YouTube. And that usually takes about 24 or 48 hours. Another question that came in, 
Jim, is um, and you spoke about it just a moment ago, the mold on the film. Is that, uh, is that hazardous? Well, everybody claims that mold is hazardous to your health. You know, is it really hazardous? No, not really. Okay, but it is dangerous to the film because it eventually eat up the film, especially if the film has audio. Uh, the, there's a lot of sick film, uh, like my parents had, that they would put an audio track on, on one side of, of the 16 millimeter film, and that gets attacked the worst. Uh, we're trying to work with the bowling association to transfer the entire history of bowling in this country, and sadly, ABC Wild World of Sports, uh, with bowlers that you and I could not pronounce their names, had filmed a lot of these things back in the 50s, but sadly they had reels of audio tape, they call them mag reels, uh, that followed the actual you know, film. Well, those mag reels molded and the audio was destroyed. So you know, the mold can destroy the film. If you get to it soon enough, I can clean the film. It's a little bit of an involved process, but you can clean the film, transfer it, and save it. But if you let it continue to eat it, eat it away, and the film will be gone. Okay, questions coming in. I'll get to some more here um, and just hang on. Uh, Jim, there was a uh, mention, someone says here, you mentioned sprocket damage. Right. And how, what's the best way if you're looking at film to determine if there's sprocket damage or is there a way to look at it and tell without oh, yeah. having to go through it? it? It's the perforations. Okay, the sprocket perforations on either side of the film. A lot of times film projectors will chew it up. So if you look physically at a piece of film and you don't have perfect holes and you've got you know jagged edges, then there's sprocket damage. Uh, and that generally takes place using it old in old projectors. Uh, they'll go ahead, they'll, those projector reels begin to turn and the film is in proper position and they'll just chew up the film. Now the new high def film scanners that we have and that others have as well, uh, ours does not use sprockets. It uses pinch reels. Uh, so because sprocket damage, if you're trying to run it through a system that has sprockets, it can't do it. Our telecenter system would not transfer it. But the high-def scanner would because they're using pinch reels. And again, there's a big difference in the consumer transfer, like I said earlier, and even my professional telecine system. Uh, that was a real-time system. You couldn't call it corrected automatically. You couldn't improve the clarity. You could do that after the fact. The new high-def scanners allow each and every film, you know, image is filmed. Every single frame of that film is filmed. And so you can color correct automatically. You can enhance the clarity. You can enhance the focus. And you can do a lot of work which basically saved my marriage when I tried to help the Boy Scouts. <laughs> well, good for that. Um, so we've got a question about the equipment specifically. Would you mind sharing um, uh, a little bit more about the equipment, um, uh, its, its size, uh, kind of acquisition costs and that type of thing, and also the types of film that you would transfer, so I, I guess uh, the, the different uh, media format. So if you take a moment and, and, and uh, help us okay. out with that. Okay, if you're, ta if you're talking about current film scanners, okay, they will range in price. Uh, you can find, you know, and just because somebody says they have a film scanner doesn't mean that that's the best quality. Okay, you can pick up a film scanner for, you know, use one for anywhere from, you know, twenty to $30,000. Uh, ours was well over $100,000. Uh, there are some film scanners that are half a million dollars. Okay, uh, the thing is, the film scanners themselves uh, have to have the proper technology. Uh, the film scanner that we have also has new systems that allow film that is badly warped uh, to be transferred. Years ago on a consumer system, I transferred a reel of film on a little device called an Elmo. It's a direct transfer system for film. And it uses a sprocket, it uses the gate, film gate, and when the film is, is warped, it goes in and out, the film gate goes in and out, so the focus goes in and out. And physically on that particular system, I held my, hang, my fingers on the film gate for 45 minutes, which was very difficult, but I was able to transfer 90% of the film. Well, the new, the, it just, it, I did what I had to do. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you do that. 
and the new film scanner allows some systems that, that put a lot of pressure on the film to you know, straighten it back out to allow your film to be as good as possible under the condition that it was in. Mm -hmm. And what about film, uh, video film formats? Um, for some of the folks that are uh, just hobbyists and not necessarily engaged, they, they may be familiar with a, a couple of the, the sizes, uh, 16 millimeter VHS, well, but what about okay. other sizes? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the, the film system we use can transfer uh, regular 8 millimeter, which was the first film that the consumers had. Then they went to Super 8 and 16. We also can transfer 35 millimeter film. There's enough of it. Uh, there are systems that will transfer the bigger 70 millimeter, which is something that we'd never get involved with. So we're pretty much, you know, handling either 8 millimeter, regular 8, Super 8, 16, or 35 millimeter. Okay, and someone is asked here about nine and a half millimeter. Is that a European size? I'm not sure of that one. Mm, I've never heard of nine and a half millimeter, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, the system can adjust if, if there really was a nine and a half millimeter film. Hmm. Okay, now that may be actually eight millimeter film, uh, but measures nine and a half millimeters with the sprockets. <laughs> Eight okay, millimeter but, film expanded, huh? So. Yeah. But you know, if, if there was a nine and a half millimeter film, then we can make an adjustment to the uh, the scan uh, for anything from eight millimeter up to sixteen millimeter. Okay. And um, yeah, so someone just wrote in said that it's a French film with perforations in the center. Um, would be the nine point five millimeter film. So I don't know that. Um, I've ever seen one, but uh, um, the folks that have this have a treasure on their hands just in the film itself, probably. A uh, quick question about, um, you, you spoke about DVDs, and the question mm -hmm. is, is all, are all DVDs created equal? I know, no. uh, and, and if you could just address that a little bit. And then you talked a little bit about having various solutions, uh, backup strategies. So when you go into a 7-Eleven, um, could you tell us, you know, a big corporation, could you say, this is the plan we would put you on if you let us do everything we'd want to do? I'd love to hear that. Okay, well, first, first I'll address DVDs. Okay, DVDs are fine to watch. They are not, repeat, not ever designed or were never designed for storage. And I don't care about the baloney that you hear. Well, I'll transfer your stuff to a gold-plated DVD. It'll last 100 years nonsense. It hadn't been a hundred years since DVDs were invented in the first place, so how do you know? Secondarily, it's easily scratched. If you stick it in your car, it could be, you know, easily warped and twisted. A DVD is, you know, it could be cracked. A DVD is designed, as far as I'm concerned, to just watch. If you transfer your film, your video, anything else like that to a digital file, you can make a DVD to watch. That's fine. And when that DVD dies or it fades over time, you can make a, from the digital file, you can make another DVD or you can make a Z-Ray disc that comes out 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. But the DVD itself is not a good storage media. And people that tell you that they transfer your VHS to DVD either don't know what they're talking about or really don't care about your history. Now, related to storage, okay, and preservation. With a major corporation like 7-Eleven and others, we digitize and create the uncompressed files. Our database, what's called a compressed, oh, let me go back to DVD for just a second. One thing too, when people get their VHS that they've already transferred to a DVD, they've got to get it back from a DVD back to a digital file, or again, their history will be lost. But the one thing to remember, too, is sadly, a DVD is a compressed format. Now, compressed format means you're throwing away data. For example, we transferred all of the Kennedy footage. Kennedy, is, uh, the Six Law Museum has been a client of mine for 25 years. We transferred all of their footage again from NBC uh, on his anniversary, I guess it was a couple years ago. And each one-hour tape of the Kennedy assassination uh, material is about 120 gigabytes in size. That size file doesn't play nicely on any computer. It'll be important to my editing system, but it doesn't play well anywhere. 
So we create an MPEG-4 video file, which is a compressed file. It looks good, but it is highly compressed. Namely, it takes a 120 gigabyte size file and reduces it to two gigabytes. Now that should tell you you're throwing away an awful lot of data. That's what's happening when people get their VHS thrown into a DVD. You're throwing away data. It's a little bit like what happened with Southwest Airlines. We had about 4,000 videotapes we transferred for them. They had, before I got the contract, they, or after I got the contract, they had 200 tapes that they'd already digitized through a consumer system to an MPEG-4 format. And they asked me point blank, do I need to retransfer these tapes? And I told them, I said, if the quality is good enough for your purposes, the answer is no, you don't. But I said, I can do one thing for you. You give me a tape, I will transfer it professionally. I'll give you that file, and then you can make your own decision. A week went by, and the guy called me up, and he said, Appleton, you did that, for, you did that on purpose, didn't you? I said, did what on purpose? He said, transferred it to high quality. He said, obviously, we have to transfer all 200 tapes again. So, you know, people don't understand that, that, you know, consumer systems give you basically consumer quality. And if that's acceptable, go ahead and do it. But if you really care about what you're going to transfer, you've got to do it right. Okay. Um, an interesting question on that same line, and then uh, I'm going to ask two questions, and, and maybe you can segue into both of them. Okay. Um, uh, we've got somebody that says, so, uh, that, that this person says, I've heard problems about the DVDs and even the gold varieties. Um, and what do you think about the M discs? And those are the ones that the military grade, uh, uh, basically stone etching types of things that are supposed to be virtually indestructible. Do you have any comment on that? And then the next question was, uh, kind of a follow-up to what I have got uh, originally asked was when you go into a company like this, uh, like a, a Southwest Airlines or a, or a um, uh, 7-Eleven or Boy Scouts or whatever it is, and you're, 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 you're talking with them and they're, they're asking your opinion, what, I mean, you obviously must have a bunch of solutions for them to, uh, to, to save their their mm -hmm. material. Uh, what what would be your your strongest recommendation? So the M disk question, and then the the other part. Well, uh, first the M disk. Okay. There is no such thing as a non-destructible anything in this world. I don't care was M disk, you know, Z disk, no videotape. Everything has to be protected in, in in its own way. Okay. Would I trust a disk or an M disk? No. You know, is it better than a standard DVD? Yes. But I wouldn't trust it. Okay, anything that's a disc, you know, it can be damaged, it can be dropped, it can be, you know, and they say it's virtually indestructible, you know, virtually. That means it still can be destructed. So, you know, I wouldn't carry, I wouldn't to put anything on a disc. You know, I'm going to keep it on hard drives, I'm going to keep it on backup tape that is proven. For example, LTO5 tape is what NASA uses and has been for years. Okay, that's a proven concept. You have to migrate it about every 30 to 35 years. But it's proven, okay? It's it, it's something that has a history behind it. You know, when you have an M disc or a, you know a gold plated disc, there is no history behind it. So it's it's somebody else's guesswork, okay? And frankly, I don't care about somebody's guesses. I want the truth. Okay. Now, from the standpoint of, you know, what do I recommend? Preserving your history with a corporation is important. Okay. We started with 7-Eleven. We started off with preserving historical history. But that, in and of itself, preserving history is important. But what is actually more important than even preserving history is to be able to use it. That's where the database came in. We created a, a searchable database that is free uh, for the client and allow him to access it. The 50,000 items we digitized for 7-Eleven, we can access within a fraction of a second. It can be hosted as a website. It uses the MPEG-4 format, which is a highly compressed format within the database. Okay, the individual can use those database size files directly from the database for social media or websites because they look pretty good. You know, they're not great, but they look pretty good. You don't have to go back to your archival quality unless you're going to do an edit project, a television commercial, something of that nature. But the database also for corporations is every bit as good for current media, uh, current commercials, current corporate videos, you know, you know things of that nature. 
uh, it's just it's it's an important function that allows you to actually access it. The Southwest Airlines folks uh, had a half a million dollar database that didn't want our little database. I made it anyway. And they called about six months ago and they said, we know that there were three videotapes you did digitize. We've got to have those for a meeting this afternoon. And we can't find them. I walked over there with my database on a USB drive, a little portable drive that picked into my laptop, and I asked them for the name of one of the videos. Typed it in there, four videos came up on the screen in a fraction of a second. I said, any of these ones you're looking for? She said, yes, those three. So every single asset is barcoded by us so we know exactly you know what it is, where it's stored. So they knew the barcode. They searched their own database for the barcode. Sure enough, they found the videos. So you know, a database is a scary thing. The IT departments do their job. They, they and they try to tell you that you really can't use it because you don't understand it. And it's true because it's a long learning curve. Our database is simple, easy to use. I can teach people how to use it in 10 minutes. But that is an important part of a major corporation to let them know that not only do we protect your assets, both historical and current, but we allow your ability to use them. OK. Well, that's awesome and great information. I know there's a number of folks that um, are involved in talking to different businesses. Uh, Jim, and I want to give you, just announce the results of the poll here that about uh, today's audience, about three quarters of us have uh, are in the professional world of organizing and dealing with um, imagery. imagery. Um, uh, Twelve percent are hobbyists. Uh, a six percent are uh, preservationists and archivists, and another six percent are um, other. Um, that you mentioned a couple of you mentioned a couple of things. I know there's some questions and some real personal interest on on the level of a few folks. Mm -hmm. um, what I'll do is um, encourage you to talk to Jim. He is a fantastic resource. Um, even if you don't use his organization, he is, as you can tell. Um, an evangelist for getting things preserved and doing it the right way. Um, we are, will have this information out and recorded. We want to thank everybody for coming. Jim, before we leave, though, could you talk to us? I, I, I must say that I've learned a number of things here um, besides just the super cocker that can climb trees. But um, could, you talk to us, uh, could you talk to us about that LTO5 tape a little bit? I, I must say I, we don't work in the, the video world very much. Um, and I know that's part of a, like a tape backup system type of thing. And, and yeah. that, is that what you're talking about? Yeah. That, you know, in addition, with a corporation, we, we, we create the digital files. We keep them on our servers. We put them on the customer server. Uh, we then also, as a secondary backup, and we encourage them obviously to put on, uh, you know, rate protected drives. We we represent a company that, that makes rate protected drives, so we sometimes can give a customer a 25 or 30 terabyte drive that is, you know, rate five protected, or mirrored, whatever they want for their systems. And again, you know, the cloud is one, but the LTO5 tape is a proven system. Uh, for example, uh, the NASA people that I mentioned earlier, they started with LTO3 and then went to LTO4. Uh, it's, it's a little tape cartridge uh, that allows you to go ahead and you know verify, and it verifies itself. It's a very good, safe way to digitize and protect your media. Uh, it takes a little longer to get back in case you lose because you've got to play a tape to get it. But it's a good storage media that's easily portable. You can put it in different location. You can, you know, a corporate president can take it to his home, have one at his office, one at his house, because you don't want your backups all in the same place. Okay, it, it, and whether it's in the same building in a different office, that that still is the same place as far as I'm concerned. It needs to be physically a different place. So the L2L5 tape is cheap. It's not expensive. There are backup systems on DVDs that are much faster. But again, they got the same problems with DVDs that we talked about earlier. Uh, but the tape storage is a good, proven system. It's been around for 35 years, and everybody knows how it works. Well, I'll have to attest to that. My uh, IT director uh, just recently came back from a, a meeting about doing backups. And 
uh, what is old is new again, and, and there's a whole uh, march back from this digital world storage back to tape. It's kind of an interesting, um, mm -hmm. interesting, interesting transition. Well, we have um, certainly enjoyed your time. Uh, with so many professionals and uh, organizers involved, I know if they run across a, a, a job, they're probably asking, well, can we work together to do something? I don't have $100,000 to buy a piece of equipment. Um, so do you do you, uh, do you do that type of thing, Jim, in your business? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, perfect. So uh, feel free to give them a call. Um, and again, thank you so very much for your time. We'll conclude this session. Join us on July the 12th and hear our uh, friends from Kodak Alaris and uh, an extensive historical view backwards about photo scanning and where it can go into the future from Bruce Holroyd. So thank you. We hope that you all have a great rest of the month. And Jim, thank you for joining us today. Rick, thank you very much.